Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm a, or a howdy. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a lawyer from Texas, and you may wonder why I'm here. Uh, frankly, I wonder the same thing. <laughs> I'm not an anthropologist, a botanist, a neuro chemist, uh, none of, uh, uh, an academic or any of these things, uh, but yet, why am I here? The regulations and laws uh, have a tremendous impact on your discoveries, your research, these practices and uses of uh, what we've been uh, talking about. I first, of course, want to thank Dennis, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't have to say anything. We know where each other stands. And, and uh, Anton, uh, you know, whose unbridled spirit, vision, and uh, passion and generosity uh, for this area, I, I truly appreciate and respect. Uh, also, of course, Annette, uh, who's, where is Annette? Annette. <laughs> her, uh, her helpfulness is only surpassed by her charm. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, Mitch, all the tech, uh, technical crew and everyone here, all the presenters, and uh, paid visitors, my gosh, we ought to pay you to listen to us. Nobody, <laughs> nobody will listen to us. Okay, so over four decades, I have represented the uh, Native American church and the peyote dealers in Texas who are licensed by the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, and the Texas Department of Public Safety to harvest and sell uh, peyote to Indian members of the Native American uh, Church. And as Dennis said, I've done all that pro bono, paid my expenses, paid the expenses of other, others. And uh, during this, uh, 40 plus year odyssey, Linda and I and our children attended many, many, many uh, peyote meetings or Native American uh, prayer services. Uh, I fought the peyote wars. Uh, Indians, and some not Indians, primarily Indians were being arrested in Texas and in other states charged with the serious offense of possession of a controlled substance. And so uh, I was down uh, where, the rubber, where the rubber meets the road and uh, helping these Indian people. And it was a tremendously gratifying and uh, educational and inspiring experience for me. All right, in, in exploring the past, present, and future of ethnopharmacology, the use of the sacrament peyote has been the trailblazing breakthrough in the U.S. to secure legal rights to use a psychoactive Schedule I substance in uh, a religious context. I could stop right there. I mean, that's one of the primary messages. Now, as we know, and, and we've had some good background, the use of peyote is the oldest religion in North America and apparently South America also. Uh, we have these... Uh, Lin uh, Linda took that picture back in the 70s at the Whitty Museum. We had uh, discovered that, but the ancient roots of peyote are lost in time. We know that these peyote specimens, which have been re uh, uh, radiocarbon dated 
uh, 6,000 years old that were in the Shulman Cave where there's marvelous shamanic uh, petroglyphs and of course the gas, mix, uh, the gas mass spec uh, analyzed uh, approximately 2% mescaline in these specimens. There's a great article in the Journal of Archaeological Science, very scholarly. I'll, uh, I'll footnote that in my paper. Buy the book. Uh, all right, so <laughs> the uh, Spanish conquistadors of the 17th century chronicled Indians using peyote. Spanish priest issued an edict in 1620 forbidding peyote as pagan and opposed to the purity and integrity of our holy Catholic faith. Uh, therefore, peyote was the first psychoactive substance prohibited by law in the Americas. We didn't escape the uh, Inquisition. Now, it was the fabled Southern Plains Indians, the Comanche, the Apache, the Kiowa, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the horse riding, war bonnet warriors uh, of the Southern Plains that uh, established the Native American church in Oklahoma in 1918. Now, uh, James Mooney was actually sent to Oklahoma in 1891 to, to study the Kiowa pictorial calendar. There were, photo, there were drawings of macaws and monkeys on that old Kiowa calendar. He was the first, it wasn't Schultes, he was the, fir, the first ethnologist in 1891 to witness a uh, peyote ceremony, and he was the one that told the Indians, look, what you have is a religion, it's a church, and he helped the Southern Plains Indians in 1918 uh, draft their charter and file it uh, with the uh, Secretary of State. Now in 1990, to talk about a little law, I don't want to talk about too much law, I'll put you to sleep. Uh, in 1990, the Supreme Court, uh, in a obscure case out of Oregon involving unemployment benefits for two Indians that had tested positive for uh, peyote, radically changed the legal architecture, they overruled the compelling interest test. There had always been, it had been a 30-year precedent involving religious freedom that you balance uh, the religious freedom, which is heavily weighted against any restriction of religious freedom. And if you're going to restrict it, you have to show a compelling public interest and use the least restrictive means. So there was just a dark cloud hanging over the Native American church. And I was uh, fortunate. I uh, created the strategy of petitioning the United States Congress to uh, enact the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and uh, which we call ARFA, and to amend the American Indian Religious Freedom Act to specifically include uh, peyote. And there was, frankly, a coalition of many churches, Presbyterian Church being an example. There were other churches that, were, that got up in arms when the Supreme Court saying that when it comes to police power, that's, pre, that's preeminent, that's it. So with the help of other, well, Reuben Snake, a well-known Winnebago Indian that had a great uh, relationship with Congress. James Botchford with uh, Wisconsin Judicare, who had studied with Houston Smith, uh, just did a tremendous job. The Native American Rights Fund out of Boulder, Colorado, they knew the 
the process of passing legislation. They had paced the halls on behalf of Indian people for uh, decades before that. And so, uh, and it was Senator Inouye, a native Hawaiian, a World War II hero, uh, uh, who was head of the Senate Judiciary Committee because of his influence. I worked with him at a vital time. I provided some important uh, verification from DPS and from the Attorney General in Texas. I had good relations with them that the level of cooperation of the Native American church uh, had been excellent and that the regulation of peyote had been problem free. That enabled him to swing some uh, senators that were uh, concerned about it. So ultimately, as was suggested before, this legislation was the uh, bedrock for the Supreme Court decision in the UDV case in 2006. That was based on uh, RIFRA and ERFA, and the same is true with the Santa Dime case that was a lower court case, never appealed 2009 in Oregon. And, uh, you know, again, without the legal battles uh, and I'm not going to talk about the law. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read that. I'll put it in my, uh, my paper, and I'll chronicle all the cases and all the uh, uh, citations, regulations. But really, this presentation is about the cosmology and the visions, these, the sacred practice of the... Uh, uh, ceremonial, ritual, religious use of peyote. Now, uh, I'll give you a little background on how Linda and I got involved in 1967, right? Ooh. 50 years ago, it was the summer of love. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Linda and I were uh, students at the University of Houston. I was uh, the attorney general of the student body. Linda was a, a, an administrative secretary, helped me with my law papers. <laughs> and, uh, and we were, we were uh, U of H was aligned with SDS, Students for Democratic Society, and the John Birch Society was sending all these young Americans for freedom to try and get us out of uh, National Student Association, which was, you know, we, uh, we were activists. Uh, and of course, during this period of time, there was a huge shift in the social paradigm. Creative expression, personal grooming, sexual freedom, anti-war politics, SDS, the Chicago 7, up there in uh, 1968, uh, opposing at the Democratic Convention, opposing uh, the Vietnam War, the hell no, we won't go. That was chanted uh, through the streets. Woodstock in 1969, music was changing. Religion, uh, yoga, meditation, uh, the Maharishi, uh, uh, you know, gurus. And of course, there was marijuana. There was LSD, there was psilocybin, there was peyote, there was mescaline. So, what did Lynn and I do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're, we're citizens of the Woodstock Nation, right? And uh, we tuned into the zeitgeist of the time, the spirit of the times. It was the late 60s and early 70s. I mean, what are two healthy, curious college students supposed to do? <laughs> Smoke pot, uh, experiment with LSD and mushrooms, and uh, uh, you know, <laughs> sexual freedom. <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. <laughs> all right, so uh, you know, there were some students from the University of Texas that were going down to South Texas in the chaparral where the peyote is, and uh, 
they were harvesting peyote and they had a way date of synthesizing organic mescaline from peyote. Well, one of them gave me a little vial. I know, you know. Uh, it was about, it was definitely over a gram, about a, gra a gram and a half. So I go home, I just take it. Uh, the, uh, and I'm doing some pranayama, some breathing, some kundalini yoga, and then all of a sudden there was like a bolt of lightning. It was the classic kundalini, <laughs> kundalini experience. There's a, a bolt of lightning that shoots up my spine and ignites this thermonuclear explosion. You could, uh, you could have ignited every atomic bomb on this planet and it wouldn't have been a hummingbird's whisper <laughs> to, to this ex experience. And uh, this, you know, this immersed in the center point of creation where everything that is, was, and will be beyond space and time and the peace and, and, and then coming down through that uh, you know, y y your ego's completely shattered. You're just merged uh, with the divine, intelligent, evolutionary force uh, of the uh, universe. Uh, you know, some people use the God metaphor. Uh, the, uh, of course, Bonhoeffer said uh, before he was uh, imprisoned by Hitler in a concentration camp and, and killed, he said, you know, that term's been misused so much. Uh, we ought not use it for a hundred years. Uh, I, like, I like the mystic. I like the mystics. I like the mystic uh, Meister Eckhart, the 13th century uh, Dominican, who said any definition you can give of God is not God. Uh, our, our puny little minds, there's no way we can articulate the ineffable, the, the Tao that can be spoken is not the Tao. Anyway, so ultimately, 1969, I'm a young lawyer. Texas had draconian marijuana laws, 5 to 99 are life for any amount of marijuana. Lee Otis Johnson, a black advocate, uh, activist, received 30 years for one marijuana seed that was found in his uh, car. Now, I didn't represent him, but I handled, the older lawyers weren't trusted. They didn't know uh, marijuana cases, drug cases anyway, and I, I learned about the Fourth Amendment. I was in court uh, on all these uh, countless marijuana cases, never lost a client to the penitentiary, which was uh, uh, quite unusual. But at all events, all right, I'm a lawyer, and I want to stay within the bounds of the law uh, for reasons that are obvious to all of us. So I discover that this mescaline is the active principle in peyote and that the Indians go to have this long-standing practice of taking a pilgrimage down to uh, South Texas uh, to get peyote. They first go down, now this, this starts in the 1870s after the Civil War and they're all rounded up and uh, put in uh, put in Oklahoma again. These are primarily the Southern Plains Indians at this point, although it, it, it spread widely ultimately. But they had a relationship with these peyoteros uh, the, that, uh, put them on up there, yeah. Uh, they had a relationship with these peyoteros. This is a Mata Carta that Stacy talked about, Amadita. This is the early 70s. Uh, and so we found out uh, that the Indians came down to Amada's place every year, February, because they let them off. The, the, it started historically, they'd let them off the reservation, Washington's birthday. 
So they'd go down there. Washington's uh, birthday in, in February. And these, Amada was born, go back. Amada was, was born in 1904. Her father before her, Ezekiel Sanchez, was a peyotero. When she was four years old, her father and her brother would be out with a buckboard harvesting peyote, bring them back, and she would turn them over each day on the caliche beds to dry them because the dry peyote is not perishable, it's light, it's easily transported and the Indians would uh, come down and uh, get uh, peyote from them. There, there was another important dynamic, this long-term friendships that was established between the peyoteros and the uh, Indian people. So we shyly go down to Amada's humble place. I mean, if it's the Tyringham <laughs> for the Indians, very humble place. And uh, I received the biggest, warmest, Linda and I did, greeting of our life. Oh, come on in. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, please let me get you some coffee. And Linda is from the banks of the Rio Grande, and uh, half Hispanic, re reared by her Mexican-American family, habla español bien, eh? uh, and Amada just adored her, you know, and I'd tell Amada, you're my most important client, and she was. And so uh, Amada said, well, and this was in uh, late in the year, she said, come down here. She was 68 years old. In this picture, she lived to be 100, almost 101. I delivered the uh, eulogy at her funeral. Stacy was wonderful with her. Would go down there, visit her every Christmas, and really, we took good care of Amadita. Amada it means loved. Uh, beautiful name. Uh, she's first licensed peyote dealer. She and her husband, Claudio, uh, had been arrested, put in jail, nothing came of it. They, she ultimately was given the key to the city of Laredo at a special uh, ceremony. Uh, her husband before, they both of them from Los Ojuelos, uh, his father, he was a peyotero, uh, White Thunder, Anthony Davis, you'll meet him uh, here in a minute. Uh, he used to go out with uh, Claudio I was given Claudio's peyote box, uh, which, uh, you know, they keep their instruments in, uh, and that's a particularly uh, a nice one. Uh, this is an old bucket that Amada had on her porch. On this stuff. Uh, let's see, that snake peyote, that's rare. Uh, the clusters. Uh, Salvador, you'll meet him. He, now, he, he harvested that cluster and, and uh, brought, it, uh, brought it back. Uh, the, uh, th this peyote trade on the Mustang Plains of Texas, George Morgan wrote a thesis, uh, and that's the Bardis Escarpment uh, down there in South Texas where the peyote, uh, where the peyote uh, grows, and uh, there's a topo. But uh, his thesis, and you can still get it, you can get it from that Ann Arbor place in Michigan. I'll cite that, but it's a marvelous book that he wrote in 1976, his dissertation. Okay, so we go back. Oh, I told Amada, I said, we don't know these Indian people. You guys, you know, we can't come down here. She invited us to come down. She said, you can be my guest. So we go down there. And uh, we, uh, we walk up this Caliche driveway, and this, this Indian, Rutherford Lone Man, uh, who we developed a very close relationship with, a Southern Arapaho, comes out, biggest smile you ever saw in your life, and greets us, oh, hey. Good to see you. Come, let me show you in the TP. 
uh, you know, glad you're here. Uh, and so that night, <clears throat> we stayed out in the cold wind. Boy, it was a cold February day. Sometimes it gets cold down there in South Texas. And we were sitting on a railroad tie. There was no uh, fire, no peyote, no nothing. We're just sitting there listening, 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 listen to that drum, those wonderful songs. And uh, so that next morning, Rutherford came, came out and he said, you know, I could feel you out there last night. And you come back next year. I want you to come in. There's, uh, there's, uh, uh, I want you to be with us. So we did. And then after that, uh, we came every year and then we started going out through all Indian country, Four Corners, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, up into Sioux country, in the Dakotas, the Northern Arapahoes in, in Wyoming, the Washaw, Nevada, uh, the uh, New Age in California, uh, the, the whole deal. Rutherford, now these old men that we were sitting up with, they were the grandsons of the Indians that had been removed into Oklahoma. They were conquered people, and, and, and you have to understand you're dealing with conquered people. Uh, but uh, their grand, the lineage with the grandfathers went to the grandson. The, the father's out uh, chopping wood, gathering water, hunting, and it was the grandsons that the grandfathers taught. So we had this direct lineage way back there. All these men are gone now with these old uh, road chiefs whose grandfathers, who were the uh, Plains Indians, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that got removed. And it was a wonderful experience. Rutherford's grandfather was an old man, lone man, uh, he had Rutherford follow a, one red-tailed hawk for three months. That hawk turned his head a certain way. Rutherford knew what it meant. Approached his nest, made a certain call. You know, they, they, they merge with the spirit. And then Rutherford would use that spirit of that red-tailed hawk. He would use swift hawk, same way. He could unconsciously talk to you and move his hands in certain ways. He was absolutely mesmerizing. Now, Stacy, when he was born up there in Oklahoma, those old men had a teepee up, those old chiefs, in there doing a peyote meeting. His mother in the house, she's taking peyote. As soon as he's born, they take him out and pass him around in that meeting. He said, those old men, those old chiefs, they all put something in. But uh, a remarkable Melvin, Melvin George, Uchi Indian, he talked about, he could remember as a baby that bitter, that bitter taste in that bottle where they'd uh, give him, <laughs> they'd give him uh, that peyote. Now, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, Rutherford was also a Sundance man. That's a completely different thing. His grandfather was the last Southern Arapaho to Pierce before their Sundance collapsed. They now go up and have their Sundance with the Northern Arapaho. He was in the Sundance Lodge. They danced for four days, three nights, fast, no water, have marvelous visions. Completely different, had completely different than the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, completely different uh, than the uh, peyote uh, ceremony. But a lot of these peyote men were also uh, sun dance men. All right, talking about Indian cosmology, contrasting to European Christianity, where the belief was, well, all mankind has a spirit. The Indians believed that everything has a spirit. All the birds, all the animals, all the plants, trees, water, insects, and they take it a step further. It's part of their cosmology. They, go up look at, they grow up looking at the world that way. 
uh, that you, your spirit can communicate with that spirit. And they do. And once you adopt that cosmology, uh, it becomes as real as a, uh, Don Luis, <laughs> Luis Eduardo, uh, made a reference to that, that uh, indirectly. That it's, more power, it's as powerful as, as a spoken word, these communications, but it's uh, communicated uh, beyond words. But you you develop that cosmology, and it happens. You know, in that first meeting, when we go back, Rutherford says, you know, he says, sometimes there's a special meeting. He says, there's a friend of mine. He's talking about this divine spirit. There's a friend of mine comes in here. And these women and these old men, they reach out, and, and they embrace it in tears flow down their eyes. He said, I'd sure like for you to meet uh, my friend. Uh, and it was 16 years later before I had that experience and I knew what, uh, what he was uh, talking about. Okay, so we got Amada up there. Uh, that's, back, that's way back when. I don't know when that was. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Keep, uh, keep rolling, Marilinda. Oh, we'd take our kids down there. Uh, that's our first child, uh, uh, Maya. Uh, they'd, 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 the kids would sleep behind the teepee, the, uh, the, uh, their parents there in the teepee. There we are with Amada many years later. There's Junior and Arano. <laughs> oh, Ute. Uh, now, every... Every meeting has an intention and a purpose. That intentionality, that purposefulness, the way you approach it that way with a tremendous sense of reverence. Uh, there's no, it's not a cavalier spirit, but we, Linda and I were in uh, these, uh, there was an employment meeting. We're out there in Four Corners with these Navajo uh, minors and they're praying to be safe on their job and to be protected and be respected and be safe and uh, get receive fair pay and not be exploited. The whole meeting was in Navajo, the Navajo language. We don't we know a few Navajo words. We don't know that language, but we we the the, the entire experience we was communicated to us. We in one way caught every word. They have birthday meetings. Oh, a birthday meeting for a young child. What a joyous occasion. They have education meetings. Young child gonna start school. Someone going off to college. Appreciation meetings. Something's good has happened. They'll have an appreciation meeting. Everybody tunes in that main smoke with that tobacco. <coughs> that sponsor who's giving that meeting to, something good's happening in their life they give a special prayer now you can bring your own prayers your own thoughts your own creative energy but everyone joins together in a synchronistic way uh, involving the meetings uh, the uh, departing soldiers all oh. A health meeting. I've been in a meeting for an old Cheyenne chief, uh, Tennyson Good Blanket, uh, has lung cancer, and have a hard meeting, praying for his life, praying for his life, old Cheyenne chief. And then, it's just, just hard, and then there's this marvelous, marvelous breakthrough uh, toward the morning. It's, it's just wonderful. Tennyson told me, he said, this process works after that meeting. He said, this process works, but if there's one person in there that's against it, it doesn't work. So there's this c uh, complete unity of minds. I mentioned that tobacco. I'm not going to go much into the form, but that tobacco is sacred. They pray with it. And uh, the that's how the Calvary got to the Plains Indians. You took a smoke with someone and you gave your word and you go against, you cross that smoke, you go against that smoke, you perish. 
cavalry knew that and they'd get those Indians in there and smoke with them and they'd make a commitment and, and they'd break it, but the Indians couldn't. But that, that tobacco, there is a crossfire fireplace in the Native American church further up north where they don't use tobacco. These farms, these fireplaces, we call them farms, they're all a little different with uh, most, of, uh, most of the tribe. Uh, okay. Uh, go back to 2022. 20, Salvador. Only Salvador. Oh, you're way ahead of me, buddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got, sometimes I have one of those little clickers. Uh, going back, going back, going back. Okay, I, got, I jumped ahead of her. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. So, all right, going back to Nick. No, one more. Ah, right, there's old Nick Nicobe. Uh, uh, an old, uh, an old uh, Comanche. Uh, there's Richard Taubel, a Northern Cheyenne, and they, they got that park named after him. Oh, there's Tell Us Good Morning, a uh, Taos Pueblo Indian. He would ride horseback all the way over from Taos Pueblo to Oklahoma to go to peyote meetings. No fences back then, all that. One, wonderful man. There's Tennyson Good Blanket. Uh, there's Calvin Magpie. Uh, he's he's Northern Cheyenne, Southern Cheyenne. There's me. There's uh, Amada, uh, Virgil. Oh, now there's Wilbur. There's Leroy Shoto. These Indians have this oral history. They don't write stuff down. The amazing stories they could tell. Uh, Leroy was, was, there's Virgil Franklin. Southern Arapaho, he carried the medicine wheel for the Northern Arapahoes. There's a, he, he, he was my uncle Indian way. Rutherford was my father uh, Indian way. There's the ceremonial meal. There's Tearingham. Uh, <laughs> 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 There's, uh, there we are in the, the chapter house, uh, the legislative amongst the Cheyenne Arapaho, Archie Blackhouse, Cheyenne did that, that photo. There's Jerry Itzy, good old Navajo brother of mine. There we are a little later, I guess. All right. Oh, there's, there's uh, Salvador, uh, a, a good friend, a peyotero. Uh, he worked for Amato when he was 12 years old. Uh, there's Stacy. Uh, there's Linda. There's Vicente, Salvador's wife. The next one. All right. 94, 1994. Uh, they bust Salvador. He's a licensed peyote dealer uh, in Zapata County. He's looking at 15 to 99 or life. Uh, we won the case, and we're celebrating there in my office. Now this was late last year. The uh, Drug Enforcement Administration uh, wanted to uh, suspend his license uh, claiming some diversion. Well, he's a poor record. He hadn't been diverting anything. He's a poor, poor record keeper. But we, we went back to our office and my office and we just, uh, that, there's like 20 something years between those. Uh, photos, but he, he's there's the Navajo chapter house. Our kids are out there when they're they're young. Uh, there we're up at now. There's our daughter and our son grown up. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. There's Orphe May Kickapoo woman at Window Rock out there in Arizona. Boy, she had poked fire. Now you talk about these women. She had poked fire. You ever hear of a woman taking care of fire? They let Orphe May. She was, she, she was something. All right, let's move to Frank Takes. Oh, there's Sandy ha there's Sandy's dad, Tom Hackus, and out at Zethnautel, a traditional Navajo Hogan. Uh, right there in the shadow of Zethnautel, which is like a, a, a lightning bolt, where first man, first woman, Navajo uh, cosmology came for it. Now, that's not a photo, that's a briefcase. There's old Frank Takes Gun. Wonderful man. Crow Indian from Montana. Way back there, Montana Territory. Uh, they had a meeting. 
Uh, the Crow Indians had a meeting next, next uh, big sheep led the meeting. Next morning, the U.S. Marshals came and arrested uh, Big Sheep. And the women were crying, oh, you know, we, we prayed all night for something good. And then and this happened, and they take off, they take uh, Big Sheep away, and the old men gathered. None of them could speak English. Uh, Frank was a young uh, was a young teenager. They told him, you get in that buckboard, you take Frank's wife, or uh, you take uh, Big Sheep's wife, and you go where they took Big Sheep, and you bring him back. Well, Frank Tag's gun did that. Uh, and that began a, now this name, Tag's gun, Crowway means absolute victory, but when they're enrolling them and they're taking their name, and you've got the translator there, uh, he's trying to explain the concept of absolute victory where they, they give them an English name and then, then they'll give them their Indian half name. And he's, he's trying to describe absolute victory. He says, hey, well, you take their guns. So he becomes, Frank takes gun. There's, there's a lot of Navajos named Yazzie. Who's that? Well, that's my son. Yazzie means son. Well, they, they enrolled a lot of Yazzies out there. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway... Oh, and so Frank's, Frank's real old, and I meet him. I have him fly down from Montana. I gave the eulogy at his funeral in Lodge Grass, Montana, overlooking the banks of the Little Bighorn, where Custard has a serious problem. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, Big Sheep, to reward him, took him down to the peyote gardens. And I picked Big Sheep up, I picked Frank up, excuse me, at uh, Laredo Airport, and we're driving 45 miles south out toward Amada's house. Uh, he's gonna have a reunion with Amadita. And he starts telling me that Big Sheep took him down there, they went in an old Model T, and that they, they had a meeting there in the chaparral. And I said, well, did y'all put up a TP? No, they just, you know, they had some canvas and they cut back the chaparral. And, and, and so he starts telling me about this meeting. I'm driving this car east out of Laredo on this old two-lane two highway. It used to just be a little rut strip. And, and all of a sudden, I'm at that meeting. And then, I got a few minutes. I mean, I'm experiencing this meeting. I'm seeing the meeting. And I tell him, Frank, you know, a minute ago, I'm, I'm driving along, but you know, I was at that meeting, I'm seeing that meeting. He looks at me and he says, so all he does, he goes, this mind is a powerful thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, there's, uh, oh, he fought the Woody case. In California, there were uh, some uh, Needles, California, some Navajo miners. They were prosecuting them out there in the California uh, Supreme Court. A wonderful case. There's some people that were conscious. In a mass, this is out of that case. In a mass society which presses at every point toward conformity, the protection and self expression, however unique. Uh, is of the individual in the group becomes more important the various currents of the subculture that flow into the mainstream of our national life give it depth and beauty. We preserve a greater value than an ancient tradition when we protect the rights of Indians who honestly practiced an old religion using peyote one night at a meeting. So there's been some conscious embrace of peyote. Uh, uh, Frank Tex Gunn fought the, the uh, Navajo case. Uh, go ahead, we, we, we're running out of time here and I'm in federal court. Uh, where's, yeah, that's Holy Soul. There, oh, that's uh, Humphrey Osmond. Uh, and uh, he, uh, Frank takes gun fighting all these 
Bells. I've got all these original papers and documents and charters and photos uh, where, where uh, Humphrey wrote to Frank Takes Gun. I still think of that remarkable time, or perhaps one should call it out of time, that we enjoyed together almost 12 years ago in the teepee of North Battlefield. It remains one of the most vivid and remarkable experiences of my life. And we all know Humphrey Osmond, he coined the term uh, psychedelic, and he was the one that gave the uh, mescaline to Aldous Huxley, who wrote, who wrote uh, Doors of Perception. Carl Menninger, he enlisted all these people to testify. Uh, go to the next one. Yeah, Seavers, uh, who was a, uh, they did a test there at the, that Lexington prison forum with these heroin addicts to see if peyote was addictive and uh, at the Federal Narcotics Forum in Lexington, uh, and where no cases of addiction to peyote have ever been found, we tested mescaline. Not only did they not like it, they didn't want to use it again. They preferred their opiates. So, you know, some of the powerful evidence that uh, he put together in his, uh, uh, this uh, tremendous, uh, oh, here we are. I became an officer in the Native American Church of the United States. There's old Takes Gun, he's president. There's Rutherford Lone Man. There's Jerry Etsy, good Navajo miner, no education at all, just picked up a few words of English, slept on a, a, a sheepskin blanket out in the open. There's Amadita, we were the five officers there. Oh, and then, boy, we were there one time in Taos, and uh, uh, Rutherford leading the meeting out there. And old, tell us good morning, that Taos Pueblo Indian, I sat right next to him, I gave, gave him my blanket. <laughs> and uh, boy, that next morning, uh, Rutherford, was an amazing man, and he, he transmitted something. He was looking at that fire, that beautiful fire. And he said, you know, from where I sit this morning, it's all right there. It's all very simple. All those that have left and all those that are coming, it's all right there. It's very simple. And he transmitted something to me that is uh, unforgettable. These Arapahoes in that Sundance knew that everything's energy before E equals MC squared before Einstein discovered it. That is the truth. Uh, the, uh, oh, this has just had some profound experiences. I'm going to have to skip some of them here. Now, uh, uh, Rutherford passed away. Uh, and Sacken Fox way, his wife was a Sacken Fox. They take that body in that teepee. And they have, they have a peyote meeting right there. And uh, I was down there with a mother. I had a, a federal case in Laredo. I went to visit Amadita. We, got, we went out in a peyote garden, took a smoke. Got back to uh, Amada's house, little humble house. Got the call. Rutherford had passed away. I was taking her up to Houston so she could get on a plane and fly up to Minnesota where her only child, Claudio Jr., uh, lived. And I was just heartbroken. I'd lost my Indian father, and I knew I had to go up to Oklahoma. And I'm sitting there. We get to Houston. We're sitting there on the sofa, and I'm next to Amada. I mean, her radiant heart. You just can't imagine. And then all of a sudden, there's this field of energy that, that's coming from her to me. And it, it's like this, this, uh, this violet color, this, this field of energy. Uh, and I go, Amada, I'm getting a lot of strength from you. And she just 
She just nods her head. People told me later, oh, it's so wonderful you were with the model when this happened. I'm thinking, no, <laughs> you know, it was wonderful for me, but we, I, we go up to that uh, uh, peyote meeting, our funeral service for Rutherford in Sac and Fox uh, country. Old Indian Raymond Butler led that meeting. And Rutherford always told me, if you're in that teepee and your mind's not settled, eat peyote. Uh, if you can't sit right, you can't get comfortable, eat peyote. You're in that teepee to eat peyote, eat peyote. Well, I mean, I have this profound sense of grief. And I'm sitting next to Orphe May. Boy, we're eating that peyote. Uh, little dried ones. We've got real good ones. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm eating that peyote. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, Rutherford's laid out here on the ground. Warner's is there. I'm right to her uh, right. And boom. There's Rutherford. He's laid out. His body's right here. And there's this beautific, huge image of him in the center of the teepee. And he said, don't be sad. Don't be upset. This is just another lesson I'm teaching you about this process of life. He always talked about that process of life. He'd tell me in this meeting, we talk about this process of life. He, he said, this is just another lesson. And from his chest, there's this radiant beam that hits me in my chest and communicates this joyful, ecstatic knowledge that I always was, I always am, I always will be. Uh, it, uh, I, I, I can't describe it. I grokked it, I understood it, I had it, I understood life. And then, a week later, boy, it's still with me, two weeks, eh, it's beginning to fade a little. And by the, by the uh, Rapaho way, you have a memorial service, not uh, uh, a year later. So they had a memorial service out in New Mexico. Virgil Franklin, Black Coyote, my uncle, Rutherford's, uh, they grew up together. We have a wonderful meeting. And that next morning, I tell, I tell Virgil, Uncle Virgil, I tell him about that. I said, now it's gone, I lost it, I can't remember it. He looks at me and he said, it'll be there when you need it. <laughs> and, you know, one time I was up there in Oklahoma, I was fenced in. I had more to do than I could possibly do. I was overwhelmed. We went to that meeting. I come out of that meeting, I tell Virgil. Again, he carried the uh, medicine wheel. It was that Ouroboros. They had that before our culture with these eagle feathers on it. Uh, the sun dance up there in... Uh, Wyoming, but I tell him, man, I'm boxed in. He tells me, he said, you know, these scouts, these scouts, they used to get out there and they'd get cut off. And he said, they'd have to sharpshoot. And he transmitted something to me. I go back to Houston and I just, boom, I start sharpshooting. And I mean, <laughs> everything just fell into place uh, wonderfully. Okay, so, uh, oh, here's White Thunder, Anthony Davis, the old Pawnee. All right, we talked about these mescal beings. There they are, that mescal bandolera, those old road chiefs. Wore them. Boy, I could tell you stories about that one and that, that uh, water bird fan. But uh, okay, so Denny Sandoval. Denny Sandoval. Blind Navajo, wonderful man, Stacy May. Uh, you know, he knew that Linda and I had lost 
Rutherford, we were kind of more or less, so he sponsors a meeting for us out in Zetnautele. Uh, Marcellus Williams, he wrote a book, The Wind is My Mother, but Marce a Creek Indian, he led that meeting. Anthony was there, White Thunder, he was there and he was carrying cedar. And we had this midnight water process and the cedar, cedar chief puts his cedar on. And uh, I took note of him, had him met him before, although he was married to Rutherford's aunt, Julia. He's Pawnee, uh, she's a rapper. So, uh, uh, and then in the morning, in the morning, uh, I took note, I'd never seen this before. It was like he, he, he uh, rewound time and there was no space in between his morning prayer and his, uh, or his midnight water prayer and that, that morning prayer. And, uh, you know, it, it was this time thing that, uh, that, that was quite remarkable. So I, uh, I'm, I'm watching him and then he, he gets up and he puts that cedar on the coals and he's got an eagle feather and he reaches down and he touches that chief peyote and he comes up in an ark. And for me, Jesus Christ was standing there in that ark. And Marcellus, he let out this Cheyenne word, weeha. It's a subtle word meaning that spirit's here, calling that spirit. He, he's the road chief. And he had been trained as a Methodist minister. And that's what I saw. Linda saw just bright light. Just bright light. Uh, she didn't have quite the Protestant, Bathic, Baptist potty training that I had. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but Marcellus looked at me and he quoted that old biblical scripture in Corinthians at first we see through the glass darkly and then face to face. And I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that, that Christ the person was there, but uh, you know, Schultes. Uh, you know, I had a Christian heritage. I had some very serious questions about uh, people never heard Jesus' name going to hell and burning forever and all that. I wouldn't... Uh, uh, I'd gotten kind of discouraged about all that, but uh, Schulte said that if I'd had a Jewish heritage, that I would have seen Abraham. If I was Buddhist, I would have seen the Buddha. If I was a physicist, I would have seen patterns of energy. Uh, our daughter, Michelle, had a interesting experience. She's down at Wasiwaska with Don Luis, and there's this jaguar, like these Amazonians. There's this, uh, she painted that. Uh, that. That's cuddling, embracing this divine presence appearing in the form of uh, a jaguar. Now, Anthony told me one time he had experienced uh, the divine. Am I out of time? Yeah. Huh? I'm, I'm way out of time. Uh, All right. Okay. I'm going to just go through the slides. Well, here, I'm going I'm to just tell one more story. Is that all right, Judge? <laughs> one more story. All right. So I'm up there. Anthony, he got sick. White Thunder, he got sick. God, his, his, his father had been removed from the Plains of Canvas. He was chief of the Chow Wee Band. They had four bands, all of them 5,000 strong. They got decimated and he was a Sundance man and when he's passing on he called Anthony and he said I'm gonna said this little bird here my little son is I'm gonna give him my relation all my powers relationships with these birds and animals but uh, Anthony got real sick uh, Linda lovingly nursed him back to health and we go up to he said, I'm going to take you up to Oklahoma. There's a special meeting up there. Virgil Franklin was 
leading the meeting. It's a Mother's Day meeting, stormy weather, rainy. We're in that teepee. Oh, it's about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and raining. And there's thunder and lightning. And uh, that staff and that gourd get around to Anthony. He doesn't use that gourd they're passing around. He, there's his box right there between us, his peyote box. And he, his wife, Julia, they were married 49 years. She had passed away a couple years before. He said, I don't, I don't get this out. I don't get this out very often, son. And so he, uh, he starts singing. He, these old Comanche songs, sing these old Comanche songs. All of a sudden, there is lightning. There is constant lightning all around us. It's not in constant thunder. It's not rolling thunder. It is constant thunder, and it is bright as the noonday sun. And then he rarely do. You sing four songs. He stopped between those. Uh, he sang two songs. He stopped a minute. It quieted down. Started singing again. White thunder. He showed me that white thunder. It's constant thunder. Constant lightning. He stopped singing. Things settled down. And I got his peyote box right there. And he uh, he opens. Uh, I open that box for him. He turns. He's got that. He's got that rattler that Jude, Julia, his, his wife, had made for him. He looks at me. I say, "Damn, that's powerful." He shakes that gourd, and then puts me in the box. Oh wow. Okay. So, uh, oh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, Y'all know 48? Okay. Let's show them when right quick. What? No. They look, yeah. Also, so I bring Anthony. Oh, well, there's one. We had a meeting right there in our house in Houston. There's the old man. Uh, we made a relationship. You know, he's, he's my Indian father. It's good. Keep, keep, let's show him that. Oh, there's. Uh, Blue Hawk, but it's White Thunder. They have this naming process when they're 30 years old. He's in that uh, peyote book there at the University of Oklahoma. There, uh, there, there he is. I don't know where to put my deal. All right. Uh, there's his mother. Linda took that picture down there at uh, Amada's. Uh, ah, what a beautiful woman. Okay. There's, there's our son. Anthony loved him. There's a Totachi fan. He's supposed to make a heat boy. He's the most famous feather maker. He's supposed to back up that fan. He's supposed to make that fan for me. He made it for my daughter, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't do anything about it. Okay. All right, boy, the, his, his fans were revered. There, there he is on a horse. Oh, midnight, my horse. Boy, he was in his 80s there, Salvador. There were. Anthony and I just got out of a meeting. Oh, there's Judge uh, Kazan. Uh, they, uh, that El Laredo takes gun went down there and tried to get, get some... Uh, 68 Texas legislature had declared peyote illegal. Takes gun goes down there and he arranges a test case. He tells DPS, I'm coming down. I'm coming down. We're, 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 we're taking some peyote out. He goes to all these men dealers, and they won't do it. They won't do it. He goes to Mata, sure. So David Clark, driving old Takes Gun's uh, car, uh, pulled out of a Mata's. DPS arrested, uh, arrested him. That was the judge on the case, Judge Kazin, his son, federal judge uh, uh, down there. Uh, judge Kazin ruled in favor of the Native American church came out to Amada's, they put up a teepee, and he ate a little peyote. Uh, I've got those original news articles, <laughs> and they asked him the next morning, said, uh, well, what did it taste like? He said, well, it was kind of curious tasting. <laughs> oh, well, 
Oh, okay, there's Amadita. Which we were there at our hundredth. I didn't have ah. Oh, there's there's when we're doing Hefter. <laughs> remember that, guys? Oh, I remember. <laughs> 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 All right, now we're not we're not uh, totally demonized. Ultimately, the State Bar of Texas, <clears throat> in recognition of my efforts and Linda, with Linda's help, naturally, to. Uh, uh, protect the religious freedom of the indigenous people gave me a lifetime achievement award. So there is an acceptance, there is a understanding, there is an uh, appreciation uh, uh, in broad quarters for these Indian people and this wonderful sacrament that they share and preserve their culture. Now all these old men are gone now. I think about that, and the cosmology changes, and this getting anglicized and uh, culturized, and things are a little different. But it's all good. The old man, uh, Anthony, he, white tenor, he always said, he said, whatever happens, he said, take it in a good way. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> uh,